We're very thankful uh, to be joined by the Kansaino uh, founder and chairman and CEO, Yu Shui Feng. Thanks so much. Thank Mr. you for giving me the opportunity to speak to the audience. Yeah. Thank you for, for coming out of that meeting, uh, uh, that speech. Uh, again, your results were just out as well. Uh, we do know that you had uh, a bit of a blip upwards in 2021 because of the COVID vaccine, but you've you're mired in losses again. You had full year net loss of 1.48 billion yuan. Uh, revenue was also missed expectations. Can you explain why you're back into the red right now and what is the pipeline to get you out of the red? Yeah, if you read our annual report, uh, we did have a uh, significant loss uh, last year. But if you look at the breakdowns, uh, over 900 million RMB uh, yuan is based on, uh, is actually caused by the COVID-19 vaccine write-offs, uh, de uh, depreciation, and, you know, all those are COVID-19 vaccine related. And we have uh, over 600 million spending on R&D uh, side. If we look at that side, we actually had a good year in terms of pipeline advance. Uh, we had over... 10 IND filings and initiate over six, uh, more than six clinical trials, some in the late stage, phase three, and we have for PCV 13 vaccine yeah. finished uh, phase three and the file for NDA. And we had a very good progress on the uh, potassium based uh, DTCP combo vaccine. Right. As you know, the uh, Chinese CDC number in the past two months, the potassium uh, disease case has increased dramatically. Yeah. Uh, this world or this country definitely need a, a, a new vaccine to really uh, to uh, preventing the disease spread. Yeah. So that leads to the next question. How is this pipeline shaping up to uh, fill your your basic prediction you gave Bloomberg News a year ago that you would yeah. likely return to at least break even or profitability mm -hmm. by next year, 2025. That's Is right. that still possible or what? It's still possible. And uh, we hope, you know, we actually achieve that uh, even, uh, you know, uh, before the end of the year 2025. But uh, it's still on our target to get the, the break even results uh, next year. You also had a deal, I believe, in the middle of last year with AstraZeneca. I spoke yes. to Pascal, the CEO mm -hmm. of AstraZeneca, yesterday, mm -hmm. essentially. He talked a little bit about the deal. But we don't have a lot of uh, clarity on what kind of vaccinations the mRNA deal that you're mm -hmm. going to have with AstraZeneca is going to come out of that. What, what are we talking? It's COVID is in the past, yeah. but how are you going to use mRNA, which hasn't really didn't really pick up, obviously, uh, during uh, wasn't adopted during the pandemic? Uh, no, yes. We actually had, a, you know, uh, up to phase two uh, clinical trial stage for COVID uh, vaccine on the mRNA side. But uh, certainly our collaboration with AstraZeneca is much more strategic. Uh, excuse me, I cannot disclose, uh, sure. you know, more details. But, you know, we do have a good relationship with AstraZeneca, uh, not just, uh, you know, for one single product. We are actually had a meeting in the past months, and it, uh, I'm going to meet uh, uh, probably today with Pascal again and uh, we will have a, um, a further discussion in terms of a general you know uh, other uh, potential opportunities and then what opportunities are there to sell your vaccines abroad I know you uh, had a deal uh, for a meningitis vaccine in yes. Saudi Arabia you had one that didn't pan out too well uh, mm -hmm. in Brazil as well and I believe there's a lot there's pending litigation there with well, that company in Brazil that's something separate yes, from separate, Saudi Arabia yes. but what are the biggest challenges and what are your expectations to sell into the international market? Well, international market, actually, uh, we had a, a good experience in the past uh, few years, uh, especially during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, time. Uh, we built up our relationship with our partners in many countries. I think that gives us opportunity to, for this post-pandemic era, to expand our, you know, product uh, to the other countries based on our uh, well-established uh, network and partnerships. Like where? Where? In the developing uh, well, world mostly? Or? Mostly developing world, but we are working with a certain, uh, like a Gates Foundation, uh, potentially for the broad, uh, you know, uh, world market for some uh, innovative vaccines. Yeah. yeah. What does the Biosecure Act in the United States do to the collaborative nature of the pharmaceutical industry? I well, mean, that's a big threat if they're going to be essentially 
potentially, if it passes yeah. through Congress yeah. and the law is adopted, any federal money cannot go to companies that do business mm -hmm. with pharmaceuticals in mm -hmm. China that are of concern. I'm not yeah. alluding that CanSino mm -hmm. is of concern, but again, it's a further bifurcation mm -hmm. of U.S. and China. Yeah, it's, uh, we are closely monitoring uh, the situation, and uh, it's a concern from the industry perspective, I think, from both sides. Uh, I actually involved in the like uh, the what we call the track two dialogues on the public health, and that means uh, in the you know non-government settings, NGO settings, academic settings, we uh, you know once we all get together, discuss our common you know interest and and how we work together. I think from my uh, conversation with our partners in U.S. or you know the. We are uh, quite uh, uh, agree each other. We need collaboration, not really uh, separation, um, because many of the public health issue, issue is a global issue. It's not any single country can deal with. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have experience in the past just a few years. Uh, if we don't control in the global scale, the disease will never, you know, uh, will stop, right? Yeah. Have you found that collaboration increased or decreased through the pandemic? Well, the collaboration from our experience, uh, we had a good collaboration in many countries. Uh, certainly, there are, uh, might be other you know, issues that uh, you know uh, uh, raise up during the collaboration. But I think uh, that the intent is always trying to be on the good side. You talked about a healthy pipeline, but mm -hmm. investors are a little bit wary right now. Yeah. The stock is down 65 percent over the last year. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do to restore mm -hmm. investor confidence now that you've had several straight years of of net losses? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I believe, uh, you know, to deal with any, you know, challenges, we have to take actions, right? And in our pipeline, we, you know, develop vaccine is not an overnight thing. We need to build up our technology platforms. We need to focus on the key product that will drive the future, uh, you know, growth of the company. So we, that's why we need to stay focused. And we are working towards that, and we'll be certainly uh, to really make our uh, organization uh, more uh, focused, more efficient. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, in the past few years, uh, due to the pandemic situation, we have to really deal with the, you know, the the, the outbreaks. Uh, we, uh, uh, in a way, we were, you know, I guess, uh, grow uh, a bit. Uh, too fast, but uh, we are now uh, really to re-examine how we can really stay focused, get our pipeline in the you know to the uh, product to the market as early as we can. We talked about messenger RNA yeah. vaccines yeah. earlier. We do know that that did help uh, mm -hmm. control the pandemic spread of the pandemic in yeah. the Western world. China did not have an approved mRNA mm -hmm. vaccine uh, during the pandemic. What has kept uh, you know a vaccine maker like yourselves from developing its own mRNA? Well, you know, mRNA technology actually is one of the platform technology we have spent uh, up to now seven years working on it. Uh, it is uh, uh, some new technology. We need to work out all the details to make sure the technology will fit for the use. Even for now, I see there are still challenges in dealing with MRA, you know, with, with broad application. Um, temperature of storage is one? Yes, exactly. Temperature, uh, you know, the storage, the stability of the product. If you look at the vaccines you need to put into the field, at least two years of a shelf life, MRA certainly has not reached to that uh, point. Uh, certainly, you know, the, the advantages uh, for MRA is it can produce really fast right. and uh, in the large scale. And that's uh, especially beneficial for dealing with pandemics like we have experienced. Yeah. Do, you, do you feel, I mean, from yeah. my interview with AstraZeneca yesterday, I really yeah. got a sense that China has become a fundamental player in the global supply chain and development of mm -hmm. new drugs. Do you feel you have the right backing under this government, essentially new mm -hmm. productive forces, the new three in science mm -hmm. and technology, mm -hmm. is biopharmaceuticals under that umbrella? Are you going to get the support you need? I think, you know, China has uh, such a high educated population, 
and uh, we have uh, pretty much good infrastructure to support the biotech uh, development. Even for ourselves, we have uh, three global innovative products in the pipeline or already like uh, in the in the in the use for example our inhaled vaccine for covid-19 is the world first you know uh, mucosal delivery uh, uh, through inhalation and that actually but that hasn't gone very far that's the inhalation uh, through the you know breathing right. yeah well we had uh, almost like a uh, 10 million people use it already. Uh, but not anymore. adopted outside of China. Well, if you look at the, what uh, currently the uh, NIH is doing, they are uh, funding the research uh, to look into it. If you look at WHO position paper, yeah. it has been highly emphasized on the mucosal immunization, yeah. which is based on what we have uh, discovered. Shui Yeah. thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Love Thank talking you. about that. Yeah.